So sometimes when I'm walking down the street, I'll see people coming at me and I tend to size them up, try to judge what kind of person is this that's walking at me right now. If he's a sharp looking guy, dressed nice, um, I might say, well, that's a, that guy's got his life together. I guess he's doing pretty well. If it's maybe some big dude that's got tattoos and, and who knows what, I might say, whoa, this, dude, this guy looks like trouble. I better not make eye contact. I don't want to get in trouble. Or if I see a girl that's got, I don't know, torn up jeans, more piercings than I'd like to see, I might think to myself, oh, what's her deal? Why does she do that to herself? And as I'm doing these things, I'm making judgments about people just based on what they look like. As we get into James chapter two, he's gonna address this very thing. The idea of showing favoritism people to people and judging people based on how they look. And he's gonna show us that it really is a problem. It's a problem in the world and it can be a problem in the church too. And so if you recall, as we look at James, James is a book that's teaching us how to live well, how to live wisely. Wisdom is knowing the right thing to do and then doing that right thing. And if there's a key text to the whole chapter, it might be this, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And he ends with this in the last verse in chapter one, he says, um, religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And showing favoritism, judging by appearances is a very worldly thing. This is how we in the world will act. And it's not right. But why is it a problem? Well, let me first start by reading uh, James chapter two, verse one. And he says this, right after that, he says, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. So what does it mean to show favoritism? And why is it such a big problem? And we're gonna get to that, but before we get to that, we need to address a couple other things. We need to understand who we are before God. We need to understand what God is like. And one way that I wanna do that is by considering what is the image of God. We know that people are created in the image of God. And what does that mean? And so right now I wanna consider what does it mean that we're created in the image of God? And then next time, what does it mean that everybody else is created in the image of God? So when, if I go way back to Genesis, and if you would turn there with me, well, in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, God tells us about how the world was made. And as you know, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, and he created everything in them. He, he created the world. He filled it all in, including the stars and the moon and the, and the sun and all the creatures. And at the end, at the end of the sixth day, he created man. And it says this. He says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, he created them. And it said, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish and the birds and everything. And that's what God did when he created the man. So he created man in his own image. What does that mean? Look with me in uh, chapter two, verse seven. It says, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Or some translations say the man became a living soul. So this is amazing. This is the people, us, human beings, are unique in all of creation because God created us with a body. He formed us out of the dust of the earth. All the same stuff that, that everything is made out of in the world, the same stuff that the animals are made out of, he formed us out of that. But he formed the man like as a, a master craftsman um, just, as he, just as he wanted him. But then... He breathed into his nostrils the very breath of life. So what makes people unique is that, yes, we have bodies, but we also have these spirits, this, this immaterial part of us um, that thinks and feels and can sense beauty and wonder and can know God. We can praise him, delight in him, desire to be in his presence now and forever, or we might know God and fear him maybe hate him and want to escape his presence forever, right? That's what it means to be given this, this, this spirit and to be made in the image of God, to be able to think and feel and praise in this way. And so what does it mean to be a, to bear the image of God? Well, one thing it means is that it, we show everybody else in the world what God is like. 
Um, this might sound funny, but when my dog sees me, he's looking at the only image of God he's going to get to see, right? So how I treat this creature is how this creature is going to see what God is like. Do I rule over this creature as God rules over me? Am I patient? Do I teach him to be good? That sort of thing. Or am I impatient? Do I, do I, am I harsh? And that sort of thing. Now, that might kind of sound silly with, uh, with our dog, but consider how does God rule over us? How does, how does God care for his creation? How do I, as an as a image bearer of God, care for creation? And the same God who said to rule over creation also told the man and the woman to be fruitful and multiply. Why? Well, God himself is a father. It is his nature to just give life, right? As the father, he has always loved the son. As the creator, he has created everything, this outflow of life into the world. He's a producer of life. And so not only are we to, to, to rule over the creation, but we are to be agents that produce life, right? We shouldn't, like, for example, with our words, how do we use our words to encourage and to build up? Or do we use our words to tear down, to gossip, to, to, to hurt people? How do we do that, right? Are we acting in the image of God who provides life, or are we acting in a worldly way that takes uh, for ourselves. We're in the image of God, right? That means that we, we rule well over what God has given us. It means that we produce life in as much as we, we build people up and, and care for things. But it also means, most importantly, and maybe most obviously, is that we think um, and speak and act like God. That's the ideal. And that's really what the law of God is. God's law, his rules for us, are the things that describe what God himself is like. If, if the law says don't murder, right, which really means don't, don't hurt, don't harm, it means build up, give life, it's because God is like that. If the law says don't lie, it's because, well, God is the great truth teller. He is truth. Um, and so we ought to be like him. Um, it, in a sense, um, like what, what, when I look in a bathroom mirror, I've got the nice glass mirror, and you, I see almost a perfect image of myself. But have you ever been in one of those gas, gas station bathrooms where the mirror isn't really glass at all, right? It's just this polished steel, but it's never very good, right? Even the best polished steel is a little bit blurry. But then what do people do? They scratch it and write stuff on it and graffiti all over it, right? And what's left when I look at myself is a marred image. And that's kind of where we are at this point. So even though God made us in his image to reflect him to creation, we do have his image, but it's pretty messed up right? It's really marred. It's got scratches all over it and could be almost unrecognizable in many ways. But we do bear that image of God. So, so what? So how do we actually know what God looks like? How do we know what that image ought to be? It's almost lost when we look at each other. So how do we know? Well, here's how we know, is that when the time was right, God sent his son, the perfect image of the father into the world. Hebrews 1.3 says, the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So after thousands of years of this messed up, marred, broken image, God the Father sent his Son to be this perfect image of God. We wouldn't really know what God looks like, except now we've got Jesus. He shows us. God's law teaches us about him, but with Jesus, we actually see it. We see that Jesus showed kindness and compassion to all people. Um, he showed no favoritism, but he, he did what he did for everyone. He taught people about God, the rich and the poor, men, women, and children, people inside Israel and outside of Israel. He provided food for all the people listening to him inside Israel and food for people outside Israel. He healed people. He healed people that were inside Israel. He, he healed men. He healed women. He healed children. He healed people outside of Israel. He cared for everybody that came in his, into his path. He showed no favoritism because he cared for everyone who came into came uh, his way, who came across his path. He showed no favoritism. And so as we see Jesus, we see this great example in him. Jesus calls his people to follow him. And we follow him first by his example, by seeing this image of God so that we can start to image it. We can start to reflect it as we follow him. Maybe more importantly, we follow Jesus because he provided the way. He trailblazed the way back to God. 
when Adam and Eve were created, they were in fellowship with God. They loved God, and they, it says they walked with God. But after the image was destroyed because of sin, how do they get back to God? If you were this uh, gas station bathroom mirror, how do you get repaired? How do you polish yourself back up? How do you get rid of all those scratches? It can't really be done. But what's um, impossible with men is possible with God. And so God sent his son Jesus into the world. Jesus showed us the way, but he didn't just show us like how to be good. He actually showed us the path back to God. When the time was right, he gave up his life. He died for our sins and he was buried. And then on the third day, he rose up again. And now he sits in power at the right hand of God, his father in heaven. And then, um, and now where there was no way, now there is this way. In a certain sense, through a death with Jesus, and then through a resurrection to be with him. Nobody comes, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And when we believe in Jesus, our sin is placed on his shoulders, and then we stand before God sinless, like Jesus. Now we can follow him. The Father sends the Holy Spirit into us when we believe, just like he sent the Holy Spirit into Jesus, so we can follow him. We have this great hope that even though we die, we know that we will be raised up in a new body just like Jesus so we can follow him, perfectly imaging God forever. Jesus said, um, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will, you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the key element in understanding this image of God is knowing that we were made in the image to be like him. The law that God gives us is a good thing. It's called the royal law, the law of liberty, the law of freedom, right? And as Christians, the Holy Spirit trains us to love this law, trains us to walk in this way, and to follow after Jesus. So that's what the image of God should mean for each one of us, right? It should, it should teach us that even though how we look in ourselves is messed up, God did send the perfect image of God, Jesus himself, to show us the way. We see what loving is really like, and he provides us the actual way to follow him into God's grace. We die to our sins. We turn away from our sins. We trust in Jesus to take those, and then we follow him, and he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can start to learn to love the law and follow it. So the first reason why we should not show favoritism, we shouldn't, we shouldn't judge by appearances, as James warns us not to, is because we are made in the image of God. God doesn't show partiality. He treats all of us fairly. He treats us without looking at appearances, but he treats us justly and fairly and with love. And he shows us Jesus, that perfect image, who treated everybody fairly and with love. And next time, we're going to take a look at what does it mean then that others are created in the image of God? And I think when we realize what it means that people are created in the image of God, we'll start to shed all of these ideas of judging people from the outside or judging with favoritism and partiality because we will see there's honor and dignity um, in every man, woman, and child that God has created. So thank you.